Yesterday, uh, one of the uh, uh, conclusions, uh, I mean, that was kind of like raised from the discussion that uh, we should start with some basic materialist analysis of the situation on the ground in Ukraine and the possible uh, consequences of the different strategies. And uh, maybe I'll just give off like my uh, version of kind of like a materialist analysis of at least some part of the story about how this war uh, started and why it has not ended yet. Um, maybe with the focus more on the uh, on Russia, not, I, I think, I don't know, I probably I won't have time to speak a lot about the uh, actually the role of the West and, uh, and uh, the contradictions within Ukraine itself. Uh, but we will probably will might have more time during the uh, discussion. Uh, so, uh, I mean, when, when we start to try to approach uh, the war with uh, the our usual concepts, uh, it, yeah, well, it's not working. No, so <laughs> uh, it's not working at all. I don't think so. Or maybe I need to switch it on. Does it work? Is it, Is it better? No. no. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's on. Okay, let me try to speak more, uh, to speak louder. When we try to approach uh, the war with our usual concepts, imperialism, fascism, um, nationalism, um, we very easily uh, get into the traps of reproducing some of the war mongering. Great. Uh, narratives. I mean, let's let's start from, for example, from the NATO issue. Uh, Putin is saying that. Uh, I mean, I, I was warning you about NATO and Ukraine, and so you didn't listen to me. Now, just uh, get what you uh, what you deserved. And but I mean, wh one way to uh, approach this issue is that uh, many people simply dismiss this NATO story, it's just uh, sheer imperialist aggression and all this is just simply manipulation and deception. And of course, it uh, sounds uh, quite weird that like three leaders of Russia in a row were speaking about NATO, starting from Gorbachev, a Gorbachev who was actually very much genuine about rapprochement with the West. And yet he was speaking about that NATO should not move to the east, and then Yeltsin, and then Putin, and then many times. And we are supposed to take this as simply some something which is cynical manipulation and deception of the West, and, of, and that was so consistent for more than 30 years. I mean, that sounds for me not really plausible. Another way to approach it, which is uh, by uh, some of the so-called realist uh, scholars is just simply taking what Putin says at face value. I mean, if he says that uh, the real issue is NATO, if he says about rockets in five minutes, that's exactly the reason for the war. I mean, I think that our approach should be to not dismissing the NATO issue, but at the same time uh, thinking more critically and materialistically what exactly is the the issue behind it, for uh, for the ruling clique in Russia, or even for the Russian ruling class, and it's not exactly that they may uh, represent the existential national interest of the Russian state. I mean, and we as Marxists we understand that usually this is not an issue. Then it's uh, uh, the U Western side of the justifications uh, for their strong involvement in support of Ukraine. Do they really care about Ukrainian people? Okay, they, they may claim that they care about Ukrainian people, that, but they uh, apparently were not caring about the imperialist wars in many other parts of the world. And this is not about any kind of whataboutism, but this is just a, 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 a genuine question to understand why you care about Ukraine so much but not about the people in Yemen, but not about the people in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in, in so many African countries and so many uh, countries in Asia, in Latin America, where the West was not just uh, doing nothing, but actually doing everything to 
to, to, to start and wage the wars. Uh, and uh, if they see uh, in Putin some existential threat, let's say not just to Ukraine, but uh, they may, maybe they truly believe that this is kind of like a new Hitler for the 21st century, uh, that he would attack then Poland, Baltic States, Finland, uh, and would be the threat to the whole world order, then we need to explain well, what exactly they are frightened about. about uh, do they actually really care about Estonia or Latvia? I, I'm not sure that more than about uh, Ukraine. I mean, those are, this, 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 this are the questions for, for some basic uh, ideology critique of the of the narratives that uh, circulated about the war and where we should find some uh, materialist answers. I mean, and that, that also comes to the question about Ukraine's self-determination. When we say about self-determination, who would deter determine for whom? We, do, do, do we really believe that Ukrainian government represent the whole of Ukrainian people now? The government which before the war was not exactly very popular. Um, and uh, do we really believe that, that uh, typical Ukrainian voices that are getting to the Western media, coming from more like West connected, better English speaking, uh, usually middle class, uh, usually employed at some Western funded NGO, uh, supported from the Western donors money, uh, are these NGO professionals, middle class people do really speak on behalf of the whole Ukrainian nation, on behalf of all the classes, do they represent some Ukrainian voice? I mean, of course we understand that it's just, it should be much more complicated. Then uh, who is supposed to determine, make the self-determination? There were, for example, some initiatives to have a referendum on, on Ukraine, uh, even before the Yurmadan revolution in 2013, <coughs> whether Ukraine is, would join European Union or whether it would uh, join the Eurasian Union with Russia. Uh, that initiative didn't uh, went, so we didn't have any referendum. And for quite many people in the, this pro-Western segment of Ukrainian society, this was more like a technocratic issue that, that we are supposed to decide. And if the majority of Ukrainian society is not exactly pro-NATO and before 2014, it was not even uh, strongly pro-EU, then we should just uh, just decide on, on not, not exactly listening to themselves. So th this was more like, like a, a problem of uh, manipulating and convincing the masses and not exactly entering into a genuine discussion what should be the way of development for Ukraine. And uh, uh, even the, the, the question of NATO, before the war, uh, uh, the invasion started, uh, there have been uh, no strong and stable support for NATO, accession, uh, NATO membership in Ukraine itself. And the people in the West were discussing that w about the open doors policies, about the, uh, that Ukraine has, de definitely has a right to apply to NATO. They were not really discussing whether Ukrainians do really want to enter NATO. And uh, if you would look at the uh, attitudes uh, on the level of the whole Ukraine, including Ukrainian citizens, millions of Ukrainian citizens in Donbass and in the annexed Crimea, who were not exactly about NATO, uh, you wouldn't find even a 50% majority support for the NATO issue. And if that issue is becoming so polarizing, so, so, I mean, so, so critical, for the uh, huge political decisions, uh, should it have been more carefully approached? At least starting with some internal discussion within Ukraine, what should be our geopolitical allies? So uh, that's, that's about the narratives. Now that's uh, how we uh, may try to approach to explain uh, this war. The war was started by Putin. Why exactly he started this war? Uh, there is an imperialism theory, right? But when we say, uh, tell that, starting to analyze it as an imperialist war, what exactly we mean? Is it uh, the same kind of imperialism which was about expansion of the finance capital? Uh, 
I mean, du even during the First World War, Lenin recognized that Russian imperialism, and he said that, yes, Russia uh, has imperialist interest in the First World War, but he acknowledged that Russian imperialism was actually different from the imperialism of the Western uh, imperial uh, colonial empires. Russian imperialism was more like feudal bureaucratic, more militaristic. It was not exactly about the expansion of the finance capital. Then uh, and, and it's I even uh, difficult to uh, see what kind of like economic interests a uh, Russian uh, state could have in Ukraine. Is it a war, for example, for oil? Ukraine doesn't have oil. Ukraine has these coal mines which were not efficient for um, quite a while, causing like many, many victims because of the very outdated equipment and uh, there have been like regular cases of hundreds of miners dying in the Donbass mines. So if they still, uh, still could be profitable, they, they require investments. Uh, Ukraine retained uh, some part of the Soviet industries. The industries which were not exactly um, renovated, they were not uh, capital investment into, into, in those industries which are not exactly competitive uh, against the, uh, at the international markets. Uh, probably they may be. Uh, used and uh, some of the uh, uh, Russian officials, uh, specifically Ragozin, who is the head of the um, agency that deals with space uh, industry. So they were saying that, uh, yeah, may, we may have some interest in the, some of the industries in Ukraine that uh, yeah, are remaining from the Soviet Union and that may uh, 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 help uh, may, may, may be incorporated into the Russian uh, economic uh, production uh, for the uh, 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 airline and space production. So, uh, but uh, at the same time, the uh, level of destruction during this war uh, is leading to quite many industries just to be destroyed. Uh, Azov Stal in uh, 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 steel work in Mariupol, where the last of the defenders were just uh, surrendered, is just one of the examples of a huge Soviet plan, plant uh, owned by the richest oligarch in Ukraine, Renat Akhmetov, but also just al almost totally destroyed during the war. And Russian rockets continue to destroy uh, the Ukrainian plants, which has anything to do with the military production. So what, what exactly they are going to capture in Ukraine? If you are speaking about imperialism, then uh, so uh, we need to approach the imperialist issue from different point of view. And this uh, question of apparent lack of uh, economic interest, I mean, if, even if they win anything economically for Russia, does it really uh, compensate for all the costs of the war, including with massive sanctions and all the costs that are required to sustain and increase the number of military troops to, to produce more and more weapons and so on and so forth. So the, the, huge, the costs are huge, the benefits are problematic. And so do we really have here kind of like economic rationality? And this leads uh, quite many people to go into this madman story Putin was so kind of like becoming so 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 isolated, uh, sitting at this huge long table. I mean, scared about anyone who could approach him closer for like two, two meters. Speaking to just a handful of of people with some very freaky, obscure ideas, becoming more and more obsessed with some historical narratives about uh, Ukraine and Russia as one people, so on and so forth. Uh, and so this whole decision to start the war was either like psychopathic or ideological fanaticism. Just an obsessed person who, who didn't care about anything but his delusions. I mean, that's, um, the problem is that uh, first this, all the stories about Putin's isolation and his uh, closest uh, communication circle is quite difficult to verify. They come from some insider sources of uh, dubious uh, quality from a handful of journalists. I mean, could be true, could be uh, not. 
Uh, but the question is even uh, not exactly how that uh, process is in, in Putin's mind unfolded, uh, but uh, the uh, their actions now, when the war started, and even if they uh, did quite uh, a lot of mistakes and miscalculations, and it looks like that their original military plan didn't work, and they had to readjust it, and, to, and, that, and that, that's why this very strange withdrawal from the northern Ukraine. So they, they didn't even plan for such uh, long and uh, difficult war. But mistakes and miscalculations does not necessarily mean that the, that the, the war is just irrational, that it's just psychopathic or just fanatical. I think, and uh, uh, here I will try to explain my reasoning, that the war is actually in the rational interests of the Russian ruling class. And, and here we need to uh, first to recall that there are interests of uh, individual ruling class members and there are collective interests of the class and sometimes they do not match. And an, an interest of one Russian oligarch who lost all of his properties in the West because of the sanctions are not exactly the interest of, that, of, the, of the class he belongs to. And also there are short-term interests and there are long-term interests. And even if the, in, in the short term, the Russian ruling class may be losing from the start of the war. In the long term, maybe they are winning something. And let, let's, let's try to think about what they, what they win. Uh, the assumptions about the uh, Mad Men story is just is that something that Russia could go on like that for quite a long period of time. So there was no apparent reason to start the war. The problem is that Russia could not go on like that for a long time. And that uh, uh, comes to the uh, understanding of how exactly uh, the post-Soviet changes unfolded and what kind of the ruling class in Russia emerged as a result of the Soviet Union collapse. Um, I'm calling them uh, political capitalists. It's not exactly a very mm, like used term in Marxism, however, uh, it, it, it actually comes from uh, Max Weber, the German sociologist, also like a classical in, in, uh, social scientist, and when he uh, was talking about political capitalists, he meant uh, that there are uh, capitalists who, whose major competitive advantage in accumulating the capital, incomes, wealth, is coming from control over the political offices, over control of the state. So they are not like technological innovators, like Elon Musk or uh, Zuckerberg. There's, uh, there's been mm, practically nothing that uh, Russia produced in the last 30 years uh, of the uh, top-notch technology innovation. Maybe hypersonic weapons, but what, 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 what else exactly? Uh, the, what, what's, what, what happened after the, so the Soviet Union collapse was more uh, degradation of Russian economy, their peripheralization, the destruction of the most uh, advanced parts of the Soviet economy and turning into a kind of like oil and gas exporter. But also retaining some of that Soviet legacy that's uh, particularly in the military sphere plays, uh, plays a role now. But that's not too much. I mean, this war is not exactly to uh, uh, market Russian weapons for the whole world. I mean, and uh, we also can see that uh, Russian army performs not so well to, 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 to be a kind of like a good advertising for, that, uh, for those weapons. And uh, so the, no technological innovation, not exactly a cheap labor force. Uh, the labor force in Russia and in other post-Soviet countries is, w w was not cheap. It was not that cheap that in the third world countries, that in the global south, much more expensive than in China, for example. These capitalists who were emerged in the, during, the post, during the Soviet collapse were uh, stealing the state. 
they were stealing the properties that were created by the Soviet state. They were privatizi privatizing them. They were, this was something like a primitive accumulation process that happened in the Western Europe in the starting from the like 15th, 16th uh, century. But in the Western Europe, it was unfolding during the centuries. But in, this, in the case of the so remnants of the Soviet Union, it was unfolding during weeks and months. And that was widely perceived as a theft. The, those, the, that kind of uh, ruling class, it, it's, no, it's not a coincidence that we call them oligarchs, that we call them mafia. And uh, if you look at the polls, at the stories, uh, the uh, large scale private property in the post Soviet countries and even in the Eastern Europe in general is not legitimate. Uh, even after like 30 years since the Soviet Union collapsed, those guys who, who became in, insanely rich in the matter of months, most years, they're still perceived as, 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 as thieves, as oligarchs, as mafia, as bandits. And um, that's a basic uh, problem of the legitimacy. I mean, now we are speaking about uh, like crisis of hegemony, crisis of legitimacy on the world scale, but in case of the ex-Soviet Union, that crisis probably was extremely acute. Uh, in 2019, for example, the, uh, right before the election of uh, Zelensky, when in the elections where, where he won against Petro Poroshenko, with 73% uh, of support in the elections, completely unprecedented during, during Ukraine, right before the elections, Gallup made a global survey and published the results that showed that Ukraine had the least uh, trust in the government, in the whole world. Just 9% of Ukrainians trusted their own government. And that, of course, it's uh, an important part of the explanation why a comedian without just literally zero political experience won, won against one of the richest person in the country. <coughs> and that, that, that explains the level of distrust towards the government. And that also should remind us whether are we serious to, to see, see, see Zelensky as a kind of like a representative of Ukrainian resistance, self-determination, so on and so forth. I mean, and for, how, for how long the support of him, maybe understandable during the war, would still continue and can just not collapse after the, after the end of the war. So, uh, that, that, that goes to, the, to this problem, that uh, the rule of this post-Soviet political capitalist class was fundamentally unstable. Now, uh, many people are speaking about Russian fascism. Fascism was a much stronger regime than it is in Russia. It had a massive ideological mobilizationist ruling party, paramilitaries. Uh, institutions like uh, Gestapo, SS, so on, so forth, powerful propaganda, um, I mean, number of like ideologized intellectuals with uh, like, a lot of grievances about the, how the First World War ended. Uh, nothing like this actually existed in, in Russia. I mean, authoritarianism, uh, some kind of nationalism, uh, even attempt to, to conquest a neighboring country is not yet fascism. Uh, the regime which existed in Russia and actually in most of the other post-Soviet states, uh, Marxists actually have a very good word for this, Bonapartism, or Gramsci called it Caesarism. I mean, it's an autonomous state, usually personified by a leader, who is forcefully pushing for the uh, collective class interests. Uh, balancing some interests, repressing other interests, repressing some groups of elite, some oligarchs in Russia, which actually were trying to play their own game against Putin, and they went into either to prison or to in, into emigration. But Putin also attempted to con uh, consolidate the, most of the elites. He was also balancing some of the interests of the uh, Russian masses. 
And, uh, but this is not a hegemonic rule in, in, the, in, in Gramscian understanding, at least. Uh, this was uh, more on, uh, only about uh, prevention of catastrophe. Uh, the uh, catastrophe of the post-Soviet collapse, uh, which uh, Putin and also Lukashenko in Belarus, for example, were capable to stop and to give the uh, people in Russian Belarus some stability. And this narrative about stability that these people, Putin and Lukashenko, stopped the collapse when the, the, the workers didn't have wages for like half a year, but continued to work uh, at their industries. Uh, and, and with Putin and Lukashenko, they, they started to get some wages. There was some restabilization of the state institutions. Uh, something started to work again. Uh, however, there was no actual progressive development, but just simply stagnation, simply, simply st stability. But that was, uh, at that moment, it was already very much important. This is the, the main legitimation narrative for the, for, for, uh, the uh, leaders like Putin and Lukashenko. And now, uh, it's inherently unstable. You cannot just go on on the same story that if, if not me, the country would collapse in the 1990s forever and forever. The youngest uh, generation of Russian citizens doesn't exactly uh, recall the 90s anymore and does not buy into this narrative. And this is what we see in all the, all the surveys conducted in Russia. It's almost like, like linear correlation, the older people are, the more they are supporting Putin and uh, the war and all the, the government and the, all the governmental initiatives. The younger people in Russia are, the more they are oppositional, critical, uh, liberal and so on and so forth. And this is very dangerous for uh, this kind of uh, rule because every personalistic regime always uh, comes to the problem of succession. Who would succeed Putin when he would not be able to rule anymore because of the uh, inevitable physical deterioration of his body? And uh, this problem was uh, very apparent very, uh, recently in the most closest allies of Russia, in Belarus and Kazakhstan. In 2020, Lukashenko tries to steal the elections and it causes like a massive uprising, completely unexpected. Lukashenko was ruling the country since 1994. No one would expect that almost a revolution is happening in Belarus. Then uh, this year, in January, violent uprising in Kazakhstan, also related to the question of succession. Naz why Nazarbayev, who was ruled in Kazakhstan since 1986, is, is still he a leader or he is not a leader, or what are his relations with Tokayev, and, and so on and so forth. And in both of these cases, the role of Russia in support of Lukashenko and uh, Kazakhstan regime was critical. Without that, it, maybe the, those regimes would fall. Uh, but who would uh, save Putin's regime? I mean, China, you, you need to win something to present yourself as uh, important for China, at least. So uh, this, uh, the Russian ruling class needs the fundamental political problem that they need to solve. And now war, is actually presenting for them an opportunity to establish a more consolidated, more stable, stronger, repressive regime. And this is what we uh, see in the uh, most uh, immediate uh, reactions of the gov Russian government to the Western sanctions, to the, um, to the possible um, uh, criticism of the war from the Russian society. Uh, it's uh, returned to some of the more ideological narratives. Uh, it's uh, consolidation of the uh, Russian elite. It's uh, actually pushing to emigration, the most oppositional and the most critical part of the Russian society, which also solved some uh, uh, problem uh, for Putin. And uh, the uh, loyal to uh, Kremlin experts, now uh, they are uh, saying something that uh, even if, you, so 
so far as we are involved into this war, now we, knew, we need to use this crisis as an opportunity, as an opportunity to re-establish the Russian Federation for fundamental economic, political and social changes. Uh, on the economic level, uh, they are speaking about the import substitution, reorientation of Russia towards the global south, China, India, of course, foremost. And uh, uh, on the political level, it's more um, consolidated, more ideological uh, regime with a more articulated uh, narrative. Perhaps it would be about the, uh, on some, of, or some of the imperialist conservative kind of narratives. So in effect, it's uh, not exactly that uh, Russian, something like Russian fascism or imperial ideology that was actually the most important reason to start the war. But as the result of the war, we may see something of more like Russian fascism and more of, uh, like Russian imperialism. Not exactly the cause, but more like a consequence. And, and this uh, uh, brings to the problem of this uh, mainstream approach, how to stop Russia, about the sanctions things. Sanctions are supposed to uh, uh, turn at least a part of the Russian elite against Putin. So they, uh, they would feel that they lost their Western Bank's accounts, their villas in France and in, in London. And uh, they may, for example, unite and mm, conspire and remove Putin. But then it's, it's exactly, uh, then it's a question. Uh, whether this uh, kind of political capitalist would be welcomed into the uh, global elite on the equal status. As they, they've been quite for a long time, they were trying to, but they were always meeting this discussion about corruption, about how you, you get your money. And uh, the, uh, this post-Soviet revolution that started to accelerate in the country's neighbor into Russia, in Ukraine, for example, we had three of these kind of revolutions. They actually, they were not exactly the revolutions in the meaning that we would like to see them, changing the fundamental uh, class and state relations, they were usually replacing one uh, faction of the same political capitalist class for another faction. So Yanukovych was changed for, to a billionaire Poroshenko you know, as a result of the Euromadan revolution in Ukraine. Uh, but uh, these kind of revolutions, they were destabilizing the states and th they were allowing for various political agents both within and also outside of the country to exploit the outcomes of the revolutions and to uh, impose their own interests. And as a result of the Euromedan revolution, we've got more of control uh, from the Western powers, mostly from the United States, but also EU as well, uh, who were very uh, uh, strongly pushing for so-called anti-corruption agenda, which was uh, directly targeting the uh, Ukrainian political capitalists or Ukrainian oligarchs. And uh, I mean, if this is on the, in the, on the, on the perspective, then uh, it actually becomes an issue of the Russian ruling class survival of retaining their main competitive advantage in this war. And this is why they are unlikely to surrender. And this is why the, all the strategies which are focused exclusively on sanctions and weapons uh, may not exactly work because they fundamentally misunderstand why this war is going on. Uh, let me finish here. I think I'm, yeah, I've been speaking more than I had time, and let's discuss other questions during the discussion.